1993's The Three Musketeers Review and Thoughts. One for all, all for one, and once and for all, solving the mystery of how do you get an American to empathize with a Frenchman? You give him a cowboy. No, four of them. Remember when America and France were close? Yeah, bombing towns to smithereens, calling liberation can put a strain on that. So, I'm going to start by telling you this was a movie I absolutely loved. This video will have a number of jokes, and I will get into some serious topics. If you're looking for a review that talks about, oh, the movie doesn't really hold up, it's been outdone by later movies because of that, it's not as much fun to watch today, and or it's different from the source material, so it sucks, whether you agree with that assessment or not, this is not the review. I will be going into the politics. So yeah, I'm not going to obsess over, there are definitely some differences between this and the novel, and that's fine. That's not a, I, I don't think that's a major problem. I realize this video is long, I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. I start this video with a review, most likely with zero spoilers. If I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so, hold up an index finger so you can mute and skip ahead and you see me lower my index finger. As soon as I end the review itself, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers for the film and source material, including discussing the ending. So... This movie is rated PG, and so is this video. Despite some of my videos, there will be no strong language whatsoever in this video. And... Right, yes, the MPA rated PG for action slash violence and some brief sensuality. I think it does make a lot of sense. I, I'd be fine showing this to a child. And... The... That brings us... So, yes, I am not entirely sure how many times I've watched this, but it it's at least twice. I watched it, I guess, not when it first came out, but just a few years later, I think. And, yeah, I watched it again right before starting to record this video. So it is very fresh in my mind. And, let's see, yeah, um, so, plot. France, 1625, young D'Artagnan heads to Paris to join the Musketeers, but the evil cardinal has disbanded them, but three of them resist. The three, Athos, Porthos, and Aramis, he meets them and joins them on their quest to save the country. So... I was not expecting the movie to include very much of the novel, and I definitely wasn't expecting it to be an accurate adaptation. This is Disney, after all. So I was pretty stunned that with this movie, they managed to take the entire book and throw it right out the window and just write something that fit what they wanted. I'm kidding. I just thought that was a pithy way to start the... Yeah. No, it, it follows a lot of, of the book. Now, let's see. So, yeah, um... I added this to the schedule, you know, when I realized it was on Disney+. Plus. And honestly, the main reason for that, you know, the cast. I really, really like the cast. And I, I remembered it being good. I'm a big fan of 90s action movies. I prefer the R-rated ones to the PG and PG-13. You know, your, your face-offs, your Con Airs, the original Universal Soldier, that kind of stuff, but I can definitely get down with the less, uh, yeah, this is much more, you know, I would not recommend those movies for kids. And let's see, yes, so the, that, yeah, getting into the writing, so the original writing, the, the original novel, you know, so, yeah, as someone who loves French culture, I want to make sure I pronounce his name correctly. Alexandre Dumas is what I would be saying if I hadn't actually read the book, seen how he treats women, like a misogynist, so I will be calling him Alex Dumbass. Seriously, though, French culture is hugely underrated by Americans. And, yeah, obviously, R.I.P. You know, I, I take issue with his politics, he wrote, the, the book is very well written, 
for sure. It's no wonder that people are still making movies, you know. I guess, has there been a more recent version? Like, major American version since 2011? Possibly not, but, you know. Other than that, the, the, um... I guess I could just very briefly find the connection. So the... Uh, here we go. Yeah, they made a short version in 1903. That's that's how long this book has been getting. And there was... Oh, there yeah, there was a TV series in 2016 that I don't know of. And yeah, there are... There are a lot of versions of it throughout the decades. Like, looks like every decade has at least one version of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, since 1903, every decade. So, so that's, that's literally, they've been making versions of this story since movies have been getting made at all. Like, that's, that's really, really soon after the the medium even became a thing so yeah the screenplay was written by david lowry and he is still writing he wrote something yeah he wrote two movies that came out just last year i gotta say i i'm not really familiar oh yeah yeah he wrote money train which not uh, yeah okay that's not exact this is better written than money train I can never remember if Tom and Huck... No, I don't think Tom and Huck was the one I watched. But I did watch one of the 90s... Um, what are they called? One of the, one of the adaptations of the... Uh, uh, Tom Sawyer, I think the book is called. He wrote Star Trek V, the, the movie. I mean, there's some good stuff in there, sure. And, yeah, he has some TV writing credits. And, yeah, he's credited with writing the story for the, for the video game of Star Trek V as well. Now, yeah, the, the writing is pretty good. There, there's very frequent action, which a 90s audience kind of expected. The characterization... Like, some, some of the characters don't actually have a huge amount of screen time, but their their personalities shine through. Like, you really get a good sense of even very minor characters. And I think that is more or less... Uh, yeah, as an adaptation, I think the a lot of the stuff they get rid of, I, I think it's okay that they got rid of and certainly there are there are some very clear reasons for some of the changes which I'll get into in the uh, thoughts sections um, yeah most of what they left in I did you know I, th I thought yeah it's it's there's a there's a couple of things that I wish that they had changed or gotten rid of but by and large, yeah, they. I think they did a good job of, like, looking at the book and being like, okay, what of this is going to work? This is more fast-paced than some of the other versions of the story because the book itself, there are some parts of it that are difficult to make very fast-paced. You know, it was very different. You know, I, I hear that they had to change things like that when they... Uh, when when Peter Jackson, you know, adapted the Lord of the Rings, for example. Uh, I haven't read those books, uh, but I do love the movies. And yeah, you know, it is the the book. I think I will just very briefly. Uh, so the Three Musketeers. The novel is from 1844, so there were very different expectations. You know, there there are some fairly recent, like, uh, they didn't have to change a huge amount for the adaptations of the um, uh, Hunger Games, you know, which I also read and watched those movies, uh, you know, because today, writing for, maybe it helps that that's YA, but yeah. 
let's see. So, but but yeah, um, I don't know how super obvious it is, but I do. Behind me, I do have the the book itself, and you might not believe that I actually have my, my copy was actually autographed by Alexandre Dumas himself. You definitely shouldn't believe it, because it's bull. And the direction was handled by Stephen Herrick, and I'm not super familiar with his other work, but he has some very notable titles, and he is still directing, so that's cool. He directed Dog Gone, which came out last year. And, yeah, you know, the, other, the only other things of... Actually, yeah, I've only watched one other thing by him, and that's the uh, live-action 101 Dalmatians, which I'm not super proud that I watched, but I think I just had a Disney phase at the at the time that, yeah, it's, it's fine, you know, for what it is. I do prefer the original animated, but yeah. So yeah, other than that, he directed Holy Man, Mighty Ducks, Don't Tell Mom, The Babysitter's Dead, Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure and Critter. So, yeah. He, you know, he is known for making movies that appeal to young people and, you know, covering multiple genres. I'm like 90% sure Don't Tell Mom the Babysitter's Dead is like a black comedy for, for younger audiences. And that, it's certainly the title would hint at that. Uh, let's see. Yeah, he has uh, 15... TV credits as director, and, and 15 for a movie. He apparently also wrote Critters, or, or at least helped, helped write it. There we go. So, worst to best, other than this one, the different versions of the story that I have, the, the different movies that I've watched, they're all entertaining, but they all have something frustrating about them. 2011, 1973, The Musketeer, 2001, Revenge of the Musketeers, a.k.a. Daughter of D'Artagnan, and The Man in the Iron Mask. I do want to note something I realized reading the book after watching the 2011 movie, which is also, it's, it's one of the better Paul W. S. Anderson movies. He actually took a lot of elements from the book and just kind of reversed them in kind of weird ways to get this new thing so like what in the book is a mutual romance and and in like in the 73 one is a mutual romance is now one person trying to seduce the other unsuccessfully a necklace that was gifted and discovered by the wrong person is now stolen and planted like it is deeply fascinating as most paul w s anderson written and or directed movies are it's it's like i yeah I already made a video on that. I swear I'm not going to spend forever in this video talking about that. Because I did already bring up a bunch of stuff. And yeah. So, just a few days ago, I rewatched 2011 and 1973. Those are the two that I have access to. It's been at least a year since I rewatched the other three. And let's see. So, yes. All for one and one lighthearted adventure for all. This is about what you'd expect Disney to release. There's humor that, you know, some of the humor is purely for children, but there are things that are funny for teenagers and adults. Everything is divided into black and white. Let's see. History is sanitized almost beyond recognition to preserve the so-called innocence that the majority of adults in the Western world anyway prefer to believe their offspring possess. With that said, it's an entertaining ride, and let's see, and parts of it are definitely irritating to everyone over the age, age of seven. The story is easy enough to follow, and yes, yeah, some fellow critic quotes, peak 90s, so many such great actors at their best, 100%. Every single actor who appears in this are trying, and, and almost all succeed. Nobody is just like phoning it and nobody in this just feels like ah whatever it's a paycheck no everybody wants to and and they're not even and they're not like trying to upstage each other either they they uh, you know they let each other have their moments but yeah really really great uh, yeah 
yeah, some say it's light, it has nothing smart to say, but it works. Yeah, it, it has, there are definitely some political messages to draw from it, but they tend to be fairly simple. Good comedy, good action, too many characters, but at least all of them have a backstory, love interest, something. Love seeing Tim Curry as the villain. It's a movie that the people making it loved making, 100%. Maybe problematic by today's standards, Disney-fied version of the novel, the pacing and tone changes for the worse in the second and third acts, true. A product, today every movie is a product, but back then that wasn't the case. It was made because the Kevin Costner Robin Hood did well, true. Tim Curry is playing Frank Furter dressed as a holy man for Halloween. Yeah, yeah, kinda, that's true, and it's, it's glorious. And that's a reference I would not have understood if... When I first watched, you know, I, I did watch Rocky Horror Picture Show. It's not a boxing movie, but only relatively recently. Like, I don't know, I may, maybe a year ago or something to do a video on it. Fun movie. Anyway, let's see. A again, did an entire video on it, not going to talk much about it here. Those who have never seen the previous Musketeers adaptation or a truly exciting Hollywood adventure in the grand style may be swept along, but the mechanical paint-by-numbers feel of this outing is too evident to ignore. I wouldn't quite go that far, but I there's definitely some truth to that. I loved it when I was 7, I hated, or hated it when I rewatched it at 13. About all I remember from watching this rousing, calamitous, hyperactive film is flashing white teeth, sword fights, and hair. A glorious profusion of luxurious, romantic hair. Director Stephen Herrick and writer David Laurie haven't simply adapted the Dumont classic, they've given it a shot of B12 and mounted it on a pogo stick. The result is a blur of galloping horses, last minute rescues, daring fights, uh, daring stones, fist fights, sword fights, and radiant damsels in distress, all presented in the same slapstick mock heroic style that Richard Lester brought to his marvelous adaptation of the same story in 1974. Yeah, there's definitely some truth to that. Honestly, I have very little issue with the uh, 1970. Yeah, I don't know the 1970 1973 version by Richard Lester. Really, my only issue with it is I. Overall, I think that Richard Lester's, you know, um, the, the, um, oh, actually, now that I think about it, um, hold on. just really quickly going to make sure I have it right. Christopher Reeve said of Richard Lester, who is still alive, wow, he's from 32, so he's like 80. Well, uh, 81? Wait, am I, do I have that right? 91, holy crap. Dude must live a very, yeah, he's, he's taking care of himself. Christopher Reeve, RIP, had a really excellent quote about Lester. He was always looking for a gag. Sometimes to the point where the gags, yeah, he's talking about Superman 3, sometimes to the point where the gags involving Richard Pryor went over the top, and he points to a particular one that he said, I didn't think it that was particularly funny. And it is, like, um, I gotta say, you know, Richard Lester also worked on, you know, directed, like, uh, what's it called? Yeah, Hard Day's Night with the Beatles. I, I don't think I watched that one, no, but... Certainly some of the Beatles movies were a lot of fun. Um, so, not saying he's... I'm, I would, I'm definitely not saying he's untalented. And, and Superman 3 does also have a very bad script. But him constantly looking for a gag, I don't think necessarily helps a movie like the 1973 Three Musketeers. And I really think... It, I, I think it outright hurt the two Superman movies that he directed, you know, although I suppose it was only reshoots for Superman 2, but anyway, I, I think those movies would have been better without all these gags. But yeah, the, let's see, but that is about it. I, um, yeah, there's definitely some really good stuff, and yeah, like, if you want, if you want a deep, uh, deep, if you want more, one with perhaps more to say, I would maybe recommend, yes, then I, then I would probably recommend the, the 73 one over this one. 
it's uh, you know it has some some good things to say about pub you know like like class and honor and such that that this movie does not quite have and honestly i don't think this movie couldn't have had those but it was made during the 90s and the 90s you know you got to keep things moving you know the 70s had a lot more patience for pacing the the audiences had but you know, uh, I would I would definitely say you could probably watch. Yeah, the seventy three one is also also has a PG rating. You know, the the yeah the twenty eleven one is PG thirteen. I would not show that to someone who wasn't at least thirteen years old. But yeah, the seventy three one. You know, if you have a kid that is, you know, that's willing to watch a seventies movie. You know, I'm not saying there's something wrong with not being willing to watch, but yeah, if if they can, then then that is, I, I would probably recommend that. Now, the opening does a very good job setting a tone and kind of like this is a movie that does a good job with most of the character introductions. Like most of the characters, when we first meet them, they are doing or saying something that is. That, that really tells us about their character. I don't really want to detail the the opening. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be talking about the details when I get into the th first thoughts section. But yeah, and I um I suppose an argument could be made that parts of the movie are a bit more dark compared to others that are very light like it get it gets about as dark as it can get away with on a pg rating yeah i i think you know and it, and yeah and then a bunch of it is light so that they can say look it's you know it's not like super scary for kids because you know oh they can they can't take the entire movie being scary but yeah i suppose i suppose it does a, a fine job balancing the tones I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending, but if it's what came before, I think the ending is perfectly fine. It's it's the best ending it could be for the movie that it is. No Deus Ex Machina, a little bit of convenient writing, and yeah, uh, the ending titles like don't sit through them if you don't want the annoying theme song stuck in your head, but. Yeah, you're you're not really missing anything if you skip them. There's nothing. Yeah. And let's see. Right, I don't think I've said yet. I do recommend either reading or listening through the the original book. It is legitimately very well made. I would say that it is the kind of thing you know, if you if you just read it because you want to see how well the adaptation is or something. Do note, there's a lot of story in the book that's not in this movie. I, I haven't watched the sequels to the the Richard Lester, but I, it seems like at least the the first of the sequels that that was back when they would sometimes make two movies at the same time because they were expecting both of them to make enough money that that would, you know, because I yeah, like I said, I just rewatched it and they actually have the trailer for it at the end before the end credits start, so. They filmed both and and were ready to, to, yeah, ready to release the second when they released the first. The, ah, let's see, what was the thing I wanted to say? Yes, it seems like the there might be more, so some of the story from the book in the, in the first sequel, but yeah, otherwise, you know, you might be frustrated that this is you know but they included as much as makes sense to and it's a it's a good place it's a very natural place to end the the story of the of the movie it actually yeah um several of these versions of the three musketeers are not are, are um yeah don't don't have a sequel i suppose yeah maybe that's what yeah some of these are are mini series and tv series that does make sense as 
the the various adaptations. There's a 1987 to 1989 anime. That's yeah, huh. very cool. I I could understand that. I could definitely see how they could. Yeah. Yeah, and in general, like not all of these are. English language. There are a couple of French ones. Huh, there's more than a few. Uh, actually, yeah, wait, that's got to be, like, Spanish. Yeah, it's a story that appeals to a lot of different, uh, yeah. A lot of different people across, uh, yeah. So, Charlie Sheen... I'm not sure what... Yeah, I feel like Chris O'Donnell makes... Chris O'Donnell should probably be credited the highest. But Charlie Sheen and Kiefer Sutherland are above him because they have a bigger... In 93, they had a bigger profile. But yeah, Charlie Sheen, a lot of fun here. You know, he's he is the... Uh, let's see, what was it? Yeah, he's a, he's a former priest. But he is also a womanizer. So, yeah, that... Yeah, he, he does fine with with both aspects. Obviously, the womanizer thing comes very naturally to him and did back then. Kiefer Sutherland is basically, you know, he's he's like the intense, serious one. Like, there's a, there's not, he's not quite Jack Bauer yet, but he's, he's moving in that direction. Like, this character, you know transplant him to modern day in a post 9-11 you know war on terror americans hating muslims you know kind of world yeah he's he's pretty close to yeah and yeah chris o'donnell plays d'artagnan and someone pointed out the they pronounce it American, not French, and I, again, like, it's gotta be this, like, a lot of Americans don't like the French. I think I will discuss why, let's see, um, let's see, yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, the the way they say D'Artagnan made me wonder if they were going to break into a southern accent. D'Artagnan, dagnamit! And yeah, he is made uh, too whiny, for sure. And that was a thing with Chris O'Donnell in the 90s. I like the guy. I don't have a problem. I th maybe used to have a problem, but yeah, you know, uh, he did fine as Robin. It was the writing, I would argue, that really sank the... Because because Robin is not that good of a character in the um, movies by... I can't believe I'm blanking on his name. Um, okay, this will not stand. I'm going to look up his name real quick. But not there, apparently. Let's see. The... Uh, uh, yeah, so Batman... Forever. Joel Schumacher, R.I.P. Uh, you know, I, I would argue the problem is with the the writing more than the the acting by, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, some, some critics point out he is arrogant at first, but he grows over the film. That's very true, and it, it fits. Uh, you know, basically, he is supposed to be the audience surrogate. He is supposed to be the one that, like the seven-year-old boys and teenage boys recognize themselves in. So the fact that he starts out arrogant but grows over the film works well. You know, a lot of... Yeah. I speak from experience. I was pretty arrogant back then. And it's important to kind of communicate to young audiences, it's okay to start out like that, but don't stay like that. Steven Dorff turned down the role of D'Artagnan. Yeah, I don't think, like, you know, I primarily know him from Blade, and obviously I'm not saying that his performance would be like in, it is in that, but 
obviously the the yeah obviously would be different i do think that i'm not sure there's even a huge age difference but steven dorf looks more like an adult at least in blade and and you know chris o'donnell i uh, hold on i'll just really quickly find chris o'donnell uh, why is he not oh there he is okay he is from 1970 so he was yeah yeah he was 23 years old and he could pass for even younger than that i might as well look up steven dorf now he he's three years younger so he was he was 20 when they made this movie how did so he's 25 when they made blade I could have sworn he was at least in his 30s in that movie. Anyway, let's see. Charlie Sheen and Kiefer Sutherland appeared in Young Guns in 88, and this was derisively dubbed Young Swords by critic Leonard Maltin since it reunited Young Guns cast members. Charlie Sheen and Kiefer Sutherland, a later version of the Musketeer story, was called Young Blades 2001. I think I will just very briefly go over. So, so yeah. A lot of Americans hate French people. That by itself is not wrong. I'm not telling you not to hate people that you think deserve to be hated, unless they're members of a minority. But a lot of modern Americans don't really think about why they hate the French. They've just always hated the French, because everyone around them hates the French. I've heard a couple of different reasons, so I'll briefly go over them. They're arrogant. No more than Americans are. And keep in mind, they went for democracy before America did. They literally inspired a lot of other countries to change the way the country is run. That is something to be proud of. Some people hate the French because they refuse to go along with the invasion of Iraq, which is down to them actually looking at the lack of evidence, how badly reasoned that invasion was. One of the really big ones is that a number of Americans hate the French because of World War II, calling them cowards, which is ridiculous considering all these French resistance members, and saying that they were ungrateful for being rescued by America. The American military bombed French towns and cities when all they had to do was wait out the Germans they had, that they had already surrounded. Wait until they run out of food and they will surrender. You don't have to destroy French buildings to do it. And you can't for one second convince me that Americans wouldn't be furious if another country destroyed some of their buildings and called it helping. And yes, de Gaulle did take credit, so hate him, hate the person, not the people. How would you feel if the people of an entire country hated you because of what one of your leaders once did? Meanwhile, if you're British and you hate the French, or vice versa, yeah, you're entitled. A hundred years of war is hard to forgive. And let's see, the, um, oh, yeah, I think I will just, yeah. So, yeah, before I move on from D'Artagnan. For all they sanitized, they left that D'Artagnan, who were, we are supposed to relate to, had, you know, seemingly had casual sex. He claims that, you know, there wasn't any actual, but it's just... I'm not entirely sure if I'm if we're supposed to believe him when he says that they're, they didn't actually have sex. Because when he says it, he says it to the, the brother of the woman. I mean, of course he's not, of course he's gonna lie about, and, and the movie also doesn't really think that there's something wrong with the womanizing of if Aramis, you know, it, it basically, it's painted as something that sometimes gets him in trouble, but not really as something bad. And yeah, so, so this is, this is a movie that thinks it's fine for young men to have casual relationships with women. You know, this movie, in this movie, and if I recall also the book and some other movie versions, so I'm not saying Disney invented it, we're supposed to hate the brother of the woman, and we barely know anything about the woman. She's a prop. And, uh, I guess, I actually, yeah, I think all of them are, are brothers of the woman for defending her honor, because ruining a woman's chances at marrying is funny, I guess. Back then, the only way a woman could get by was marriage, and this is something that, like, the movie on multiple occasions brings up 
that, you know, there, there's even, there is, there's at least one, 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 um, what's it called? There's at least one time when, when the, when the movie kind of challenges, is a marriage a good thing for these people? But it, so, so, you know, it is aware that that's something you could question, but it doesn't really, yeah. And, and there's actually, there's this part where, you know, after saying, after claiming, after D'Artagnan claims he didn't have sex with this guy's sister, he, the, the, yeah, as, as he's like escaping the, the brother, he says, say hello to your sister for me. Now, even if you want to say that doesn't mean that he was, you know, maybe, maybe they didn't actually have sex. Maybe they are just, you know, yeah, it, at the very least, I would have just changed that to, I swear I didn't touch your sister and then go. But him being this coy and arrogant about it kind of suggests, at the very least, he doesn't th seem to think that it's that bad of a thing that, like, even if he didn't, the fact that his brother, that, that her brothers think that she did might ruin her chances at marriage, and he doesn't seem to mind that. He actually, the, the, the movie starts with him leaving for Paris, and she's not coming with him, so he doesn't expect to go back. He's coming, he's, uh, I want to say, oh, they say he's Gascon. I think, is that maybe a village in France? I don't remember uh, well enough, but yeah. The, the, um, you know, he doesn't expect to come back to this small, this, this small town that he grew up in. He expects to stay in Paris and he doesn't think that it's that there's something wrong with possibly ruining the marriage chances of a woman that he clearly himself does not intend to marry. And that brings us to Oliver Platt as Porthos. And originally Charlie Sheen was sought for the role of Porthos. I do think that makes more sense, but I do think Oliver Platt definitely does well at at the role. I'm not sure I would say anyone is badly, no one is really miscast, but it is a little bit, the, the, the issue of, like, Charlie Sheen playing an, a former priest, and they bring this up multiple times, you know, he, if someone dies, he might do the, the sign of the cross for them, you know, and, and one of the others says he takes death very seriously. 1993 Charlie Sheen does not strike me as a very serious person. You know, I, I know he had actually, or at least not in this movie. 1980s Charlie Sheen, yeah, you know, uh, Platoon, he comes across as serious. But at this point, and in a movie like this, in a movie this light, it doesn't completely, but yeah. Tim Curry as Cardinal Richelieu is just glorious he's so much fun to watch i i you can't take your eyes off him he's just so unbelievably fun like he doesn't shout every line but he shouts the ones that he should and and even when he is like very restrained that he does still deliver them like he never there's not a single line delivery by him in this entire movie that's just like ah, okay whatever Every single line is is just so, and and he's given some great material as well. Rebecca de Mornay plays Milady de Winter, and Winona Ryder was considered for the role. I like her a lot. There's no way she could have pulled that off in 1993, maybe around 2010. Her Black Swan performance has some of that energy to it, but 1993, I no, just yeah. And, you know, Re Rebecca de Mornay, I, I really love, I think she's, she has really, really great. I, I recently reviewed the um, Jessica Jones show, N Netflix show, and Rebecca de Mornay is excellent in that. I'm really, really thrilled that she is still acting. I, I, I have to admit, I, I'm not sure I would have really predicted that, you know, 20 years ago. I, I think I would kind of have expected the, the you know, sadly... 
a lot of actresses, when they're no longer deemed conventionally attractive, they don't have as much of a career anymore, but, you know, she she's a great actress. She she really... Sell I'll, I'll grant that some of her performances are not the best early in her career. I, I don't think I've seen a, a bad performance of her in anything more recent, but I'll grant early in her career, maybe some. But she always... Like, she's always trying to sell it. I, I don't think I've ever seen a movie where she fe where it felt like she was just cashing a paycheck. Gabrielle Anwar plays Queen Anne. My headcanon is that this is Fiona's ancestor, and she's just waiting for the right time to whip out a musket loaded with salt or something. Just, yeah. But she, yeah, she's great. Like... Honestly, she's really not asked to do very much, and that sucks because she's incredibly talented. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. In Burn Notice, she really proves that she can act. I have to admit, I'm not that familiar. I, I think this Burn Notice and then uh, Scent of a Woman, I think, are the only things I've seen her in. But she's really, really good in Burn Notice. And, and here, you know... Like, I don't know, she might not have been as much of a feminist at this point as she was when they were making a Burn Notice, but if she felt like the character were, was underserved, which certainly I would argue it is, she didn't let it show. She doesn't, it doesn't, this movie doesn't feel like she feels like the role is beneath her, which, again, I think it is, but... Yeah, you know, the the there's this thing of she's like she is in this forced marriage, you know, and she's not super happy about that and the movie actually like takes that seriously. It has some empathy for her. You know, countless women throughout history have been subjected to arranged marriages and yeah, you know, the 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 book goes into it in a slightly different way, but I would definitely say it had some empathy for her as well. M Michael Wincott plays Captain Rochefort. I, uh, I suppose, I'm not entirely sure he is named after the cheese, although one character does joke that he must be but yeah, the when when he is cheesy, he is so much fun. Always love seeing him play evil. He's good with a gun, but amazing with a sword. Not a single person has ever been able to say, with a straight face, the sentence, the movie had too much Michael Wincott wielding a sword. See, you can't do it. Nobody can do it. It's impossible. He is always so much fun. Put a sword in his hands. Put a camera in front of him. You know, we're all going to watch. It's amazing. It's so... And, and especially during the 90s, he was just... Yeah, um, one of my biggest problems with the 1991 Robin Hood is there is entirely too little Michael Wincott. Way, way too little of him. But, yeah, you know, this, the first Crow movie, again, not for not for children, but... You know, if you're of the right age, make sure you watch that if you, like me, enjoy a good... And, yeah, he's... Honestly, he's a ton of fun in Alien Resurrection. You know, he's the 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 cool character played by a talented character actor. Okay, that really doesn't narrow it down, does it? But, yeah, ton of fun in that movie as well. And, in general, that movie... You, I feel like that's a movie you just gotta watch it from the right perspective and you can really enjoy it because it is well made you know it's just it wasn't what very many people wanted out of an alien movie especially back then let's see paul mcgann plays gerard and jusak i am not entirely sure i can play uh that i think the are those maybe the brothers of the of the sister that d'artagnan uh, um, possibly. Julie Delpy as Constance. And, you know, not given a lot to do, but she does well with it. Hugh O'Connor plays King Louis. And one critic said, No wonder Richelieu wants to topple him. The queen looks ten years older than this weenie. There's an Anakin Padme thing going on here. Very true. And I think, 
you know, I, th I think there was just a, a while where that was basically the kind of thing that they, like, I guess the idea is, for, you know, there, there are a number of Hollywood movies that do that. I, I don't think that was intentional with Anakin Padme, but, you know, but yeah, I do think in this movie, the idea was, it's probably so that he can be outshined, overshadowed by his wife, Queen Anne. And, you know, as a feminist, I approve, but I don't think, I th you know, at the end of the day, like, they are still married, so it still means that she has to spend time around this, yeah, weenie is a really good way to, yeah. And, yeah, it just, it sucks that it couldn't be, you know, and, and it, it might also be that they were worried that he would, like, at, at the end of the day, the movie does have to sell that this is a man who has some power, but he needs the musketeers to defend him. So, if the king looks like an action hero, we're going to be like, dude, just give him one of the swords. You don't need all these bodyguards, you know. And, and yeah, the movie does that. I, I feel like, was Hugh O'Connor... Maybe a bit of a go-to for that. Is that him in Dragonheart? Any, anyway. And Christopher Adamson plays Henri. Herbert... Fuge as Innkeeper. Bob Anderson uncredited as the King's Fencing Instructor. Because that's the thing, you know. He does... We, we Yeah, he has a fencing instructor. There's a little... He doesn't spend a lot of time, you know, but, yeah, he's, he fences at least a little bit in this movie against the, with, or with the instructor. I forget if they're sparring or if he's just doing it in the air, but, yeah, we have to be 100% on board with, no, 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 this guy needs, you know, and, you know, obviously, Kiefer Sutherland and Charlie Sheen were dependable as, you know, can kick your ass kind of thing in, in the 90s. And let's see. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. The characters could use some fleshing out. Again, not time for it because we have to have action every so often. Curry into a slightly... Why did, no. Curry and Wincott are deliciously evil, making them immensely enjoyable to watch. Tim on screen is like those Saturday morning cartoon villains who chuckle menacingly at their own fiendish plots. And let's see. Yeah, and De Mornay, you know, does really well at what she's known for doing. Sultry, manipulative, smiling at some while shooting daggers when they look away or if she's with some wing, someone where she can get away with that. And, you know, of course they toned it down with this being a family film, but yeah. Th this could definitely be your first, you know... Yeah, if you watch this as a kid and then you grow up, maybe you'll be wanting to watch some of her other, some of her R-rated movies. Now, according to IMDb Trivia, Kiefer Sutherland, Chris O'Donnell, and Oliver Platt all endured six weeks of fencing and writing lessons. Charlie Sheen missed out on all this as he was embroiled in the filming of Hot Shots Part 2. And, yeah, one critic says it doesn't show that Charlie Sheen did it. And, and yeah, he does... Uh, he, he acquits himself just as amicably that as the, the rest do. Disney wanted Robert Downey Jr. for a part. That does make sense. If you think to, you know, maybe not as much today, but certainly 90s Robert, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. Yeah. If I, if I personally had to, I think I might make him the serious one. Uh, the the um, Kiefer Sutherland one. Brad Pitt turned down the role of D'Artagnan. Brad Pitt, wasn't he too old? In 93, when is he? He was 30 years old. Yeah, not gonna lie. I don't think that would have... I, I'm a fan of Brad Pitt. I like him a lot. I don't think 30-year-old Brad Pitt could sell. Like, I mean, he's basically... If I had to guess, I don't think they ever mention it. I'm thinking like 18 or something that... 
D'Artagnan is, because because he's like, okay, I'm an adult now. I'm gonna go be a musketeer. So he's not thirty. I don't know exactly when, but I would definitely say, yeah. William Baldwin, Johnny Depp, Gary Oldman, Jean Claude Van Damme, Carrie Elwes, and Al Pacino were also sought out by Disney for parts in this movie. Yeah, they they do make sense. I uh, I don't think. Yeah, I guess I could briefly go through. Yeah, I think William Baldwin would have been fine. Not crazy about Johnny Depp in the wake of the whole trial between him and Amber Heard. Um, but yeah, you know, if I'm just judging his 90s, yeah, I think he could have. And and certainly um, Oliver Platt. I, f I forget. Uh, uh, what's his name? Welshy, maybe it's one of the one of the people on the. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna find it real quick. So the uh, yeah yeah Welshy reviewed the this movie in in video format and he pointed out that Oliver Platt probably helped inspire the. Um, Ah, Captain Jack Sparrow. And so, so yeah, uh, you know, Johnny Depp would have made a lot of sense for, for that role. Gary Oldman, maybe for the, for the Kiefer Sutherland. I like Jean-Claude Van Damme. I think if he should be in this, it, I, I, yeah, because it doesn't say exactly, but I think, you know, I, I like him. I think he a lot of his best work is when he doesn't really have dialogue. Like, I think he's he's really good in in the uh, in the parts. I mean, in general, I think he, some of his better work lies in uh, the uh, the Universal Soldier. But or yeah, no, no the just Universal Soldier, the first movie Universal Soldier. And I think a lot of the best work he does in that movie is when he says little if anything when when he just has short lines and just relies on just his facial expressions and body language i think is some of her, his better so yeah if if you gave him a role in this where he didn't necessarily speak much actually yeah there's there's a character who's specifically like a martial artist maybe he was supposed to be in that and and jean-claude van damme was like that's too small of a part because it's not a big role i don't think he would have been great as a as a musketeer although obviously his his accent would have fit Carrie Elwes I think could have played pretty much any of the of the four musketeers although I suppose he's maybe also maybe a little old for D'Artagnan if I had to pick one I think the yeah the the um, Oliver Platt one Al Pacino that can't possibly have been a musketeer maybe Pacino was supposed to be Roche for I could see that he has the intensity for it for sure I'm glad I I prefer the the casting of this to the but for sure there is some now I think I will just very briefly talk about so as mentioned, I just watched the 73 one. I gotta say, the, the 73 one, the Musketeers themselves just don't make that strong of an impression on me, other than D'Artagnan. The rest of the cast do, really. And I think it was maybe, there was like an expectation that you had to be a little bit more subdued if you were to be taken seriously as a man in an action movie back then. I, I think the the women acquit themselves exceptionally well. Raquel Welsh, Faye Dunaway, and Geraldine Chaplin are all spot on. They're they're really great. And I like Charlton Heston's early work. I can't really speak to to his later. I I think I've only seen him in, in old movies. He plays Cardinal Richelieu in 73 and he really nails it. He has the the right kind of just this manipulative like he's he's really despicable and and great. He's not as much fun to watch as Tim Curry for sure, but yeah, I already mentioned that I I recommend the the 73 one. But but yeah, um 
let's see the um, yeah simon ward is the duke of buckingham a character who i suppose i shouldn't give away i'll, I'll just say he certainly isn't in much of this i'm not going to give away whether he appears at all but he yeah he's he's significant in the book and in 73 and 2011 simon ward does a great job he really just strong character yeah and Christopher Lee uh, plays Rochefort, and he's fun, but he's not as fun as as Michael Wincott. I, uh, yeah, again, like just at the time, the you know, men who were to be taken seriously in in big roles in movies like this maybe didn't jump. You know, Dar D'Artagnan, Michael York as D'Artagnan, does really you know jump into it, and we're also you know he's supposed to, okay. He needs to to become a you know he he needs to he's he's a diamond in the rough basically you know but yeah Christopher Lee you know there are other performances of his that are much more fun but he is good in in that as well yeah I'm not sure I would really argue with any of the casting for the seventy three one either and I don't think the casting is the problem in twenty eleven. I've, you know, Logan Lerman is one of the weaker in that movie, and he does really great elsewhere. Uh, let's see. Is there any other... Yeah, and and uh, who plays Constance? Uh, am I... I guess I'll... Okay. Let's expand the cast list. Is her name not Constance? I, I could have sworn her name was Constance. Uh, wait, is, no, that's, that's not her, that's a different, wait, uh, hold on, um, uh, okay, I am not entirely sure why I can't find, but the, yeah, the actress who plays the, D'Artagnan's love interest in 2011, she is fairly, yeah, Juno Temple is given entirely to little. Ah, uh, here we go, Gabriella Wilde. That's right, playing Constance. Yeah, and it was it was fun to rewatch because when I watched it in 2011, I didn't know who James Corden was. Now I watch most of the videos from his late night show, so it was fun to see him. It, yeah. Um, and he's also, like, he's, the material he has fits the, the, you know, he, he does the, the James Corden self-deprecating kind of thing. But yeah, Gabriella Wilde, I don't know her from anything else, I don't think, but her Constance is very, uh, huh. Wow, she plays Sue Snell in the... Carrie remake? I can't see that at all. And she's Raquel in Wonder Woman 1984. Who's Raquel? It's, yeah, I'm getting too in the weeds with this. Anyway, I don't think it was the fault of Gabriella Wilde that she is kind of bland and and not really I, I think it was the material she was given and logan lerman i am certain it was the material he was given because like certainly he's great in 2014's fury i forget if i've seen lerman and anything else from all the way back yeah maybe not but certainly i i know that he, there's other stuff that he you know so yeah um yeah, I would say Chris O'Donnell is, is the better D'Artagnan than of, of the two. But overall, the 73 one is the best D'Artagnan of them. That leaves the Musketeer. Uh, yeah, and, and Mila Jovovich as Milady de Winter is basically perfect. Like, And she's also given a lot to do in that, you know, kind of shows that she's married to the director but 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 she is one of those that actually you know some, sometimes you'll see a movie where you know uh, uh, DSD can calls it look at my hot wife you know sometimes it's like oh wow the 
the wife isn't actually that talented. That sucks. Mila Jovovich is incredibly talented, and she is just yeah. She has the she has the mystique, and the you know yeah. She can she can smile. She can look vicious. You know in in you know she has to be able to seduce people, but you also believe that she's really like kind of cutthroat and and just and yeah. Mila Jovovich is great as that. Ultimately, like I like the actors for the 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 three musketeers in 2011 i don't think they did particularly well in the movie but again material i think ray stevenson's porthos is more fun than michael platt's overall i would say luke evans aramis made so little of an impression yeah yeah for sure the best aramis is the the 93 one athos Honestly, I think the Athos in 20, you know, Matthew McFadden and Kiefer Sutherland are equally good Athos. It's down to the material. So in that regard, this is the better. So there are, so yeah, that brings us to the dialogue. There are 76 entries in the IMDb quote section and all of them are good. So yeah, this is a very quotable movie. There are a a lot of quips. The characters have distinct voices in that Most of them get strong character moments in dialogue and or action. Uh, yeah, one critic points out they say all for one and or one for all too often. That is true. It really felt like, yeah, that got pretty ridiculous. But but yeah, I don't think I would really. There's there's no major character in this that doesn't have at least one zinger like one really great line that's just like ah that's you know that that if i had watched this when it, you know it's a it's a tiny bit actually i suppose if i had watched this when it first came out i probably would have liked it but yeah i, I don't think i did i don't think i watched very many current movies when i was a kid i maybe my parents thought that current movies weren't particularly good during during that period which to be fair they lived through you know 60s and 70s which yeah really had some great movies so yeah that brings us to the cinematography the dp was dean semler who is also still working very cool uh, yeah he's he's dping something called summer gold which is set to be released this year and yeah he has <laughs> Yeah, in more recent years, uh, he's he DP'd Paul Blart Mall Cop 2, The Ridiculous Six. But if you go a little further back, oh, and I now pronounce you Chuck and Larry, but he did also DP Apocalypto, and you know, I'm not gonna make any excuses for Mel Gibson's horrendous politics and despicable anti-Semitism, but as for and I don't think I did watch that movie, but I've heard it's very well shot. He shot Stealth, The Alamo, Bruce Almighty, Triple X, We Were Soldiers, Heartbreakers, Nighty Professor 2, The Bone Collector, Gone Fishing, Last Action Hero, which certainly, you know, that movie has problems. I wouldn't really say the cinematography is one of them. Super Mario Brothers, which also, bad movie. Some of the cinematography is quite good. City Slickers, Dances with Wolves, Cocktail, and The Road Warrior. So yeah, he he had some big, you know, some major credits under his... Oh, and he also DP'd Young Guns. He had some big names, big big movies under his belt before he did this, and it really shows. Like, the, the action is very well shot, and the the stuff that has to be more, like, you know... Yeah, scenes that aren't super fast paced also do a really good are, are also really good. Oh, he actually he directed he directed in uh, two in ninety eight and he's directing something that's coming out in twenty twenty five. Hawkins and Silver, very cool. Now, uh, yeah, one critic point out the ha high angle shots used by Herrick and cinematographer Dean Semler make the characters seem mythically larger than life. Very true. And yeah. Um, the, the camera makes sure that we can, like, it's very still when we have to focus, 
but it moves fast and captures the action and makes it like the the in general the action is quite well handled in this which is good when there's so much of it Let's see. and that's also you know if what if something you really really value is a lot of action then this is you know the 2011 wall also has a lot of action but it's also a kind of ridiculous uh, yeah you know i uh, Paul W. S. Anderson movies should be watched by people who find Paul W. S. Anderson fas fascinating, but not really, like, otherwise, I'm not sure I, I can really in good conscience recommend his work. Now, this was edited by John F. Link, who has 28 TV credits and 25 movie credits, and it looks like this was one of the last... It's, it's possible he has edited TV since, but... He definitely, the, the, this is, yeah, the last movie he edited was 2000, Cherry Falls, which I don't think, like, it's edited fine. I don't particularly like the movie, but I don't think, I don't know, you know, sometimes when a movie does poorly, and I think that one did do poorly, and he also, he also edited Steel and The Quest, so it might have been that he was unfortunately um, considered as part of... Because he's he's a talented editor. He edited Commando, Predator, and Die Hard, which are three of the best edited action movies of the 80s. So, yeah, it makes a ton of sense that they brought him on for, for this because the action is one of the main... like. If he does a good job at editing the action scenes, the the rest is you know, and those three, the three aforementioned also do have scenes that aren't action scenes that are also well edited. He also edited the hand that rocks the cradle. Low down, dirty shame, and I gotta admit, I I have a bit of a soft spot for the 1996 movie The Quest. Um, yeah, I. I could watch that movie today and enjoy it. I've watched it maybe 10 times during the, the 90s and early 2000s. So, yeah, and, and certainly the, the editing in that is also quite good. And there's a, a good amount of action that, uh, yeah. And let's see. the um, Yeah. And the, uh, yeah, so that's that's more the moment-to-moment the -moment editing. The overall structural editing is also good. I wouldn't really say there are any scenes that need to be moved or removed. I don't think there are any that really needed to be trimmed down either. Like, honestly, if the movie was re-released today and didn't have to, I don't know, I might, like, trim out one or two action scenes you know, some of them are really just there because there was an expectation that we gotta keep things moving fast for the kids. And I don't think they're quite necessary. But, yeah, by and large, it is definitely well edited. Now, the budget was $30 million and the box office was 111 which... I think even by today's standards might be considered a, a profit. So, so yeah, that, and it does make a lot of sense. This really did hit what people, you know, after the 1991 Robin Hood, people wanted more of that. And this scratches that itch quite nicely. And it does also show, uh, you know, it looks like they spent a lot of money on this movie. It doesn't look small. Like, there's an early scene where we see the, the musketeers be... Dis the, the uh, Yeah, the group be disbanded. And there's, like, this massive... Like, a ton of these, you know, dozens, maybe a hundred musketeers, all in costume, all with the, the fencing sword and, and everything... And we see as they are, you know, as, as they begrudgingly accept being fired, basically. And, you know, in addition, so, so yeah, you know, a lot of extras with costumes, with props. And the, the actual, like, it's, it's like the, the, um, ah, what's, what, what are those called? 
um, it's in front of like the 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 fortress. I've, I've uh, courtyard. It's the fortress courtyard, and you know, I I don't know if they actually just found a, a courtyard that looked. I I wouldn't rule out that they might have found something that looked you know, but they they got you know they traveled there they got the people there and it really it looks completely convincing it looks like they traveled back in time and filmed this thing happening so this was filmed various places in austria which is kind of funny because there's an early line where they say it's too bad about austria too bad what it added a lot of production value to this movie and some of it was also shot in england and yeah, they they did a great job on the the various. Oh yeah, yeah, they actually yeah. There's a there's a time where there's this castle, and they actually yeah, it's the Berg Liechtenstein. So yeah, they they straight up. Holy crap! That was a. Okay, I don't want to give away. Yeah, yeah, some of the palace interiors were also filmed in. Uh, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, in a in a lo on a location, but um, yeah, they they found some great locations, and it really makes it feel like it is taking place. You feel transported to sixteen twenty five. Now the action has chases on foot and by horse. There is a good amount of fencing. There's some martial art, some shooting, including shooting while on, uh, um, yeah, while while moving fast. I think I'll say. So each action scene is unique. In the 1973, 2011, and 2001, I gotta say, I forget about Revenge of the Musketeers and the Man in the Iron Mask. I think. Maybe a few of the scenes in this were not as quite quite unique enough to like. If I if you ask me to to break down each of the action scenes in this, I think I would probably confuse at least a few of them. There's there's so much of of the some some of it kind of blends to, runs together kind of thing. And I would definitely say the action is better in the 1991 Robin Hood than this. And some of that is just down to the, you know, the, uh, do I want to give that away? I, I don't think I want to give that away. I just, I'll, I'll just say that there are some really, really cool setups for action in that movie. That this movie doesn't, you know, yeah, at, at the end of the day, I, I think... Probably the the ninety one Robin Hood had a bit higher expectations for audience, like, um, ah, what's it called? Detention span. <laughs> yeah. And the, yeah, maybe the the screenwriter had a bit more imagination or was given freer reins, but yeah. And, yeah, one critic says there are a lot of chases and sword fights, but they are fun to watch. That they are, 100%. Now, and I would definitely say that the ones in movies like, you know, the, the 73 one and the 2011 one, really, the, the action scenes do, you know, help define the characters, where in this, I mean, I think everybody at some point or another rides a horse, fences, and a lot of them fire at least one gun, so it kind of just, yeah, where, where in those others, yeah. Now, for, you know, for sure, the 73 one has a lot of fencing, but there's also this sense that they almost they, they would find it dishonorable if like an an insult has to be has uh, you know has to lead to a duel 
so yeah there's a lot of dueling in the 73 one because that was you know basically what we thought it's you know it's kind of funny I, I watched the 73 one with my dad a big history buff movie lover and he pointed out musketeer actually you know it, it denotes that they carried muskets but as soon as you fire one shot from a musket you basically you're down to the 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 sword afterwards you know so when we think of them instead of thinking oh yeah musket we all think oh fencing you know expert fencers and yeah like but but yeah in in the 73 one you know every an, an insult has to lead to a duel and you know yeah sometimes they'll duel with something other than a sword sometimes they'll you know there, there is some fighting dirty and such but in that one they the it basically does seem like you know they they felt like it would betray the the spirit of the musketeers whereas in this one there are times where people fight without the the sword and yeah you know they didn't expect the kids to care basically this the the score was handled by Michael Common RIP 68 credits for music department for movie 11 for music department for TV, 2 for short, 2 for video, 1 for documentary, and 74 as composer for movie. And, oh yeah, he, yeah, he composed for the 2000 X-Men movie. The original X-Men and, oh, yeah. Okay, so 74, except for some of them are music videos. So that's annoying. Um... Die Hard with a Vengeance, not the best Die Hard movie, but good score. Last Action Hero, which, uh, yeah, score is also pretty good. And Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, no surprise there, since they wanted a very similar vibe. The Last Boy Scout, Hudson Hawk. I mean, I think the the soundtrack of it is the the music is is fine. The Adventures of Baron Munchausen. And Brazil, wow. Yeah, so very, <laughs> yeah. Um, right, and composer of 17, you know, 17 TV credits, three shorts and two videos. And there's also uh, an entire music department, which just, uh, yeah. Uh, let's see the yeah so there are 42 minutes worth of the soundtrack right here on YouTube and uh, yeah you know it's it's worth listening to without watching the movie but you know as usual please somehow pay someone to watch the movie it's it's instead of just listening to the the soundtrack but yeah um, you know, captures the sense of adventure and the, you know, it also works for, I mentioned there are some darker parts of the movie, you know, I've, I've seen movies where, you know, they try to be both dark and light and when, you know, the music's good for one of those, but not for the other because the composer, you know, and there's no shame in that, but, you know, the composer is maybe, maybe has a too narrow kind of range for that kind of thing. The sound design is good. And yeah, I suppose briefly, so the the comedy, you know, there is some slapstick, nowhere near as much as the 73 one, though there are like catchphrase based kind of and you know, uh, let's see. I think that is what I will say for that. So, yeah, uh, I've talked some about the pacing. I do want to clarify, I don't think the movie is, like, exhausting, which some, you know, some 90s movies definitely could be. It's, and, and especially if they're supposed to be viewed by, by kids. Now, and the, yeah, it's an hour and fifty four. An hour and 41 minutes long without end credits. 
and 46 long with them, and yeah, um, I, I'll just really quickly, since it's on Disney+, Plus, I can quickly bring it up, and let's see, there we go, so I would give the movie... Yeah, I think if you if you aren't particularly interested in what happens next, around 32 minutes in, then you can just go ahead and stop watching. It's not really going to change. And yeah, so the best element is probably the, you know, Tim Curry and I can't believe I'm blanking on his name, but um Roche for William uh, Michael Wincott. Th those are yeah. Now uh, yeah, I'd say the worst aspect is the dated gender politics, and I will get more into that in the you know it's they're they're spoilers. The details for them are spoilers, and yeah, I you know like I said, still love the movie. I I think it has a lot. You know that that would probably. If I were to, if if the um, if I wanted to discourage someone from watching this, that would probably be the primary reason. And yeah, honestly, like the 2011 one gives, uh, you know, f yeah, there's there's at least one female character in the 2011 one who gets a lot of really cool stuff to do. And in this, that's just not quite the case. And yeah, you know, so for, for that, I would actually recommend the 2011 one. But yeah. Now, let's see. So yeah, the, the worst thing, according to others, is that, yeah, a number of people say it's just too childish to rewatch. And I mean, if I hadn't watched it when I was younger... If I wasn't a big fan of the cast, I think I would find it too childish. That's true. So, yeah. If you aren't, if you're not a fan of the cast and you're worried it might be too childish, you might. Yeah. Now, the thing I was most worried about was that I would find D'Artagnan irritating. The thing I was most looking forward to, uh, yeah. Over the course of the movie, he grows on you. The thing I was most looking forward to was the action-adventure stuff, and, yeah, the movie is, you know... I wouldn't quite say it exceeded my expectations, but it, it lived up to them. Now, let's see... Yeah, like, you know, in a number of ways, this movie wants to recreate the success of the 1991 Robin Hood, I would probably recommend, yeah, I, I recommend the 1991 Robin Hood over this movie. You know, there's, there, it gets very Robin Hood at, at points, and it feels kind of silly. Like, I'll grant, there's still, you know, the, the whole class thing, certainly, you know, this story works. For, I, I forget if the book also, but certainly the, the hero... In the book is also this poor man from the you know yeah d'artagnan who comes from a, one of the one of the villages or towns something like that to paris to make it big you know so like despite all the the rich people in the story we are asked to you know empathize and and um recognize ourselves in the the yeah the the guy who comes from from small things so yeah so the the trailers i would argue give at least a little too much away um but at the same time you know they're they do a good job of selling the movie and I I would recommend like you know the the original trailer is very nineties, but there's this fan trailer. I, th I think I'll put it in the um, let's see 
to fan trailer. I'll I'll put the link in the description box. The the regular trailer's easy enough to find, and you know if you if you want like some '90s nostalgia trailer, it's, you know, yeah. Some of the covers and posters do spoil too much of the movie, but also give you a good idea of. You know, the, yeah, the other ones also give you a good idea of the, the, yeah, what the movie is like. And here on YouTube, I found 12 clips, two trailers, including a fan one, three TV spots, two music videos, including a fan one, two tributes, six review analysis, two documentaries, one joke pop culture one, and three others. So, yeah. It's not, you know, like, I get why not a huge amount of people talk about it today. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying it's some misunderstood masterpiece or something, but I do think it still has some, you know, yeah, it has something to offer. And, yeah, you know, even when, yeah, I, you know, other than Welshie, you know, not, not a huge amount of people have actually done videos talking about this movie. Now, wow. Okay, so yeah, on Rotten Tomatoes, it is actually, it, it is rotten. It has a 28% based on 29 reviews, 21 of them rotten. But the audience score is 62 based on over 100,000 ratings. Let's see. And it, yeah, yeah, they say the the Chris consensus says it's a slickly unmemorable update bound to satisfy very few. And see, I could imagine a lot of the critics could probably would probably happily you know go home and watch the 73 one on home media. I guess 93. Yeah, yeah, VHS maybe, you know. And they would be happier with that than with this, and I get that. I think, yeah, I've, I, I believe I've pretty much made myself clear on that one. And, um, yeah, you know, that is the thing. Some, sometimes, you know, it's not the, it's not the hugest gap, 28% versus 62%, but, yeah, sometimes critics and audiences really don't, agree and I think in 93 fairly few mainstream audiences would have flocked equally to like let's hypothetically say that two different theaters showed these two different versions 73 and 93 yeah people would probably have gone to the 93 one but but yeah you know if not a fan of the cast it's not necessarily I, I wouldn't watch it today if I didn't you know I, I'm not really a fan of Oliver Platt, but I have seen some of his other work, and I am a fan of everyone else in the main cast. So, yeah. But yeah, the the average user rating was 3.6 out of 5, whereas the average critic rating was only 4.80 out of 10. On Metacritic, it has a 43, based on 24 critic reviews, 43 out of 100, and a 7.0 for users, but that is also only based on five ratings. So on IMDb, there are only 171 IMDb user reviews. Uh, you know, normally I just read the top voted 100, but 171, I no problem reading all those. And the, let's see, yeah, so the 100 voted most popular, you know, uh, eight of those gave it 1 out of 10, 4 gave it 2, 5 gave it 3, 9 gave it 4, 13 gave it 5, 11 gave it 6, 10 gave it 7, 16 gave it 8, 6 gave it 9, and 12 gave it 10. So, yeah, more popular than unpopular, but still a number of people do, you know, not everybody loves it. It has a 6.3 out of 10 on uh, IMDb. Based on 54,952 MDB users, let's see, 27.3 gave it 6, 26.4 gave it 7, 
that makes a lot of sense. That is where it'll land for, yeah, most people. And 13% did give it 8, so that's not nothing. 12.3 gave it 5. 6.9 gave it 10. 5.0 gave it 9. 4.7 gave it 4. Huh. That's got to be compared to some of the other versions, though. That's that's kind of low for this movie. Anyway, 2.3 gave it 3, 1.2 gave it 1, and 1.0 gave it 2. So, yeah. Not everybody loved it. Now, this won two awards and was nominated for three. Wow. It... Okay, yeah. The Okay, so I don't know what... A-S-C-A-P, I forget what that stands for, but yeah. It won for most performed songs from motion pictures for the the song playing during the end credits. And that, yeah, I could, I could see. Mo most played, for sure. And, oh, wow. Yeah, two, two of the wins are actually for that. Both of the wins are for that. Now, the nominations... Yeah, so it was nominated for Best Sound Editing Sound Effects, Best Movie Song, and Chris O'Donnell was nominated for a Razzie for Worst Supporting Actor, which... In 90... 93, 94... I would definitely say there were worse, but then he didn't, he didn't actually win it, so that's... Yeah... Yeah, he's not that bad in this. So the special effects are fine. Uh, it's not a hugely special effects heavy movie, but yeah, what what there is works. And the stunt work is quite good. That is something, like if you like 90s action movies, in part based on stunts, there's some really great stunts in this. Now, that brings us to yeah so the, the uh, yeah on disney plus this does not have any special features and yeah um i rank i i would rate this 7 remaining musketeers out of 10 and honestly like it's it's a fun watch. I could I could watch it again later today. Yeah. So let's see. That brings us to the updated rating of all of the different Musketeers movies. So let's see. Yeah. I am probably Yes. There we go. Updated rating. Worst to best. All are entertaining, but have something frustrating about them. All of the versions of the Three Musketeers that I've watched. 2011, 1973. The Musketeer 2001. This one, Revenge of the Musketeers, a.k.a. Dar Daughter of D'Artagnan, and The Man in the Iron Mask. The Man in the Iron Mask is probably the one that best gets the class warfare aspect and the, the the like it really that is a like like i said so there's something frustrating about it but that movie does really acknowledge that there you know that was a problem back when monarchies were more you know common in the west the 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 people were being treated really terribly and that movie really does put that like it, there's a there's a real focus on that in that movie, where you know it's it's definitely it's the the seventy three one also does a good job with it, but the you know like I said the 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 slapstick is is too much you know I love slapstick I just don't think it it mixes that well with more serious stuff. You know, if I want to watch slapstick, I'm not going to put on a Richard Lester movie. I'm going to sit and watch Benny Hill or Chaplin or something, you know. So, the, you know, there, you know, Chaplin's daughter Geraldine is in the 73 one. Maybe that's where Richard Lester got the idea. 
kind of doubt it. But yeah, the man in the iron mask really does a good job. You know, and it is like, uh, I'll, I'll just very quickly look up man in the iron mask. You know, don't, don't, you know, obviously I get, you know, this was around the time where some people really hated Liu, even though like, you know, because of the, the intense backlash to Titanic, he does a good job. Like, if you actually try to divorce your negative feelings th that I know some people felt about D DiCaprio at the time, if you just watch it, if you try to judge it based on, okay, is it a good performance, I would argue the, the acting he does in that movie is quite good. And it probably also has the best cast for the Musketeers. So yeah, Jeremy Irons, Gerard Depardieu... John Malkovich and Gabriel Byrne, that is, yeah, um, I would definitely say best cast for the, for the Musketeers themselves, and I think that, ah, uh, crap, what was the other thing? There was some, th oh, right, yeah, yeah, it's PG-13, which does also make sense, I, I wouldn't show it to someone younger than, than 13, but, yeah, that is a movie that really does underline there were some incredibly cruel, you know, punishments back then. And, oh, that's right, yeah, yeah, it is based on uh, Alexandre Dumas, but not, not the Three Musketeers one. I don't know what these two translate to. Wait, is that 20 years later, maybe? I know there's one called 20 years later. A anyway, yeah, um... That movie really does, like, focus on... And, and that is, like, at the end of the day, if you're going to make a new movie about the Three Musketeers, like, I... Yeah, overall, this one does not have that much... I, I think it does some things better than the 73 one, but there are other things where that isn't the case. The Man in the Iron Mask, like... It was it was different, and it focused way more on the... Like, it, it focuses more on the class than even the 73 one. And it really asks you to empathize with someone who has been punished. And, yeah, you know, like, I don't know that it really um, affected me personally, because I was already very against harsh punishments when I, when I watched it. Uh, that was something my, my parents instilled in me from a young age. But I, I would definitely say, I, I believe that... A lot of young people, when they watched that, that was something that maybe helped. I, I, you know, there are things I love about American culture. One thing I do not love about American culture is how much they love those harsh punishments. How many movies are, like, about, ah, oh, you know, yeah, you're gonna, th this bad guy is gonna be punished in this really horrible way. You know, here you have one that actually asks you to empathize with someone who's been harshly punished and yeah i'd like to think that it helped make and yeah and it was made in 98 so after the passing of the crime bill that you know that that clinton and then senator biden were so responsible for so that was one of the movies you know that and okay obviously the movie I'm about to mention is way better than pretty much any other that I've discussed so far. But, yeah, the... Uh, hold on. I can't believe I'm blanking on the name. I know... Okay, this guy is definitely in it. It's right on the tip of my tongue. Okay, and I know what year it's from, so I'll have it shortly... Uh, let's see, the, the Shawshank Redemption, you know, these are two movies that, yeah, the Shawshank Redemption and The Man in the Iron Mask, Shawshank Redemption, better movie by far, but both of these movies were arguing against the crime bill, and, yeah, I really appreciate that, and, yeah, you know, I'm not saying this movie has no politics on its mind, but it just, it is not interested in a lot of the the politics that you could focus on in, in 1625. You know, it, it's a, 
like the moment that you're making a, a that you're you're setting your story so far back in in time, like inherently, a lot of a lot of people like if you set a movie today, and then you're making the case, you know, and and that's also the the. Shawshank Redemption is also set, you know, that that was only decades back, not hundred years back, hundreds of years back. But yeah, if you set your story today and you're criticizing something that's going on right now, you're gonna have a ton of people, you know, screaming about, ah, oh, it's not that bad. It's a, you know, we shouldn't be. But if you set your story further back and then you, you know, you're basically maybe saying with the movie, look how bad it was back then. You know, that can help, like, you, you, you know, you can say, okay, so it's not as bad as back then, but, you know, conservatives love a slippery slope argument. Look how bad it was before we, ch you know, now we've reeled it in some, let's reel it in further instead of going in the, uh, you know, so, so yeah. That is it for the review itself. So once again, from here on out, there will, there be spoilers. And we are going to dive right into notes taken while watching. So, yeah, as the opening credits run... Oh, hold on. There we go. Spoiler. Yeah. As the opening credits roll and the... the um, What's it called? Yeah. As the opening credits roll and the, the first scene also plays, and we see uh, Richelieu headed to the, the torture room where he, you know, there's this, you know, family man who said, you know, my family was starving, so we stole to eat, and Richelieu has him executed, uh, which right away tells us that people are starving in France, which was a thing at the time, that Richelieu is really, you know, merciless, and it sets up this location, which is where the the story also, you know, the the last time we see the first and the last time we see Richelieu, he is in this underground cave kind of thing, and and it's it's a very cool location. I I get why they wanted that kind of, and and I wouldn't quite say there's something quite like it in the the various other versions of the yeah of the story so that's something at least and let's see um, yeah so the opening the first thing we see of d'artagnan is he fights the the brother of the woman that he apparently ruined the honor of and then he's chased on horseback by all, or wait, I guess at this point it's the three of the brothers, but yeah. I I would definitely say that this is a more attention-grabby and, and stronger opening. Uh, right, the, the, and the, um, I might have already mentioned, but the, the thing about D'Artagnan having had, you know, seemingly had sex. I think in the book, I don't think there's a question about it. In, in the movie, it's, you know, wait, did he, or, you know. But the... You know, and that actually, they could easily have used that to, like, comment on. You know, they could have had, like, a thing of how people gossip about other people's sexuality. And sometimes, like, someone will be called, you know, will, will be accused of having had casual sex who never did. And, you know, they could have done that. But, no, it's not at all. In, instead, we're just supposed to laugh at... You know, because he's coded as really as being really pathetic. The the brother, you know, he's he's not cool like the other men in in the movie. You know, he he's his voice is kind of high pitched and he he comes across as kind of whiny, which is also like okay, so because because like D'Artagnan is also whiny, but whining to protect your sister's honor that's bad, but whining in general isn't automatically anyway. But but yeah, you know it's it grabs your attention better and and gets you really f focused on the the character in the movie better than the seventy three and twenty eleven movies. And let's 
see. Um, yeah, I appreciate that the, there is some empathy for Anne and the, the whole arranged marriage thing. And, yeah, I you know, each of these movies have the, the thing about D'Artagnan accidentally insults all three of the, the musketeers. Yeah, I, I, they, they do a, a fine job in this one. I, I think overall the, the 73 one is the best in that regard. The, the 2011 is, is definitely the worst of these three, with, without a doubt. And let's see. Yeah, and, and good detail that Rochefort is a former musketeer. I, I don't... I'm not entirely sure that's in the book. It isn't... I, I don't think it's in any of the other versions. But yeah, you know, that... Like, right off the bat, we hate him. Because he betrayed the... You know, we only... <clears throat> we only find out later that he straight up murdered D'Artagnan's father. But... Which, you know, we didn't need any more reasons to hate him. And, the like, the reason that... Like, there is a... Um, D'Artagnan and Rochefort hate each other in, in each of these. And, yeah, that's also, like, they only really have a personal connection at the end. When really you could have... Uh, I guess, yeah. The thing is, if that had been established very early on, the way D'Artagnan is written as this movie, there's no way he would have been able to focus on anything else. But, the yeah, I would say their their rivalry works better in the the other movies both 73 and 2011 let's see and um yeah so i already mentioned the there's less fencing than 73 because of the the honor focus in that one let's see there is Wow, there's a lot of these notes that I honestly... I kept them very vague. What was the conflict between... Oh, yeah, yeah, Rochefort steals D'Artagnan's sword relatively early. And that also, you know, again, we hate him for that. And... Yeah, and, and Richelieu and De Winter and... Yeah, I... I, I quite liked De Winter in, in this one, though, you know, it, it would be great if she got even more to do like the, the 2011 does, but I acknowledge that a lot of the stuff that Milojovic does in that movie is completely ridiculous. It's even the, the tiniest, like, if you know anything about, like, history, it's completely absurd, but, you know, at least there is more, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, I was surprised that in this Anne, like I, I remember, I remember thinking to myself yesterday, knowing that I was going to do this movie today, having not watched it in I don't know, twenty years maybe. I did not remember about Buckingham. I, I thought to myself, either Buckingham isn't in the movie, or I don't know who plays him. And yeah, at the end of the day, like he's mentioned, and it's like, oh, you know, he rules. Uh, he rules England the way that the Rich, that that Cardinal Richelieu rules France. So okay, so he's a bad guy, because in the book and in seventy three version and, and other versions, Anne, Queen Anne, and the I can't believe I'm blanking on the name, Queen Anne and and Buckingham are together, or uh, in love, not together. And that's very important for the, you know, they're, they're trying to hide it because the queen does not love the king, but she also doesn't want him to be humiliated, you know, so she keeps it secret. And, yeah, you know, here Buckingham is just a bad guy who's gonna, you know, because, like, the, we know almost nothing about him except that he is a tool for the bad guys and he's compared to Richelieu, so... Yeah, we, we hate him. And I do understand the the you know, obviously the the 
in when, when the book was published it was seen as romantic but Disney did not want to be accused of parents of uh, uh, promoting an anti-marriage pro-cheating message so you know yeah they got rid of that although now you know for some reason they still left the in the thing with uh, D'Artagnan and the 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 sister I, I don't think we even learned her name holy crap yeah and if you if you want to say oh well they needed something that D'Artagnan is running from cuz you know again like cuz you know he starts out let's see i think he's yeah yeah he's in in the 73 one he's fen fencing with his father i let's see 2011 i don't think is there an action scene there at this uh, actually there might also be like fencing with his father just like like uh, um sparring basically not not fencing to the death or some not not over an insult or something but you know so so yeah they they had to have something but you could have had it be for like there's there's tons of other reasons why actually yeah could it would it let's see that okay so let's let's change it away from a woman because he has to fall for constance so yeah let's say that in the, the yeah in the 73 one there actually there's a there's a guy who says he'll drink to the cardinal but he won't drink to the king and that's obviously deeply offensive to the the musketeers and it actually leads to a duel yeah have have it be that you know d'artagnan is leaving. yeah yeah tell you what d'artagnan is leaving the village and the the couple of you know so yeah the the guy that comes up and is angry at him is the the chief bully from the village and he's bringing some more bullies because he likes to fight he doesn't he doesn't want to fight fair but yeah he's you know so so d'artagnan can be standing there and saying i have to go to paris i have to become a musketeer and instead of talking about his sister maybe the bully is saying you know, because, yeah, he does say the musketeers, what was it, your father failed, or, yeah, some, something like that. The musketeers are disgraced, some, something like that. Have him then say, instead of talking about his sister, have him say, the if you want, yeah, yeah, the people you should be joining are the cardinal's guards. And then D'Artagnan could respond with something like, the only reason you'd say that is because Richelieu has power, and the only thing you respect is power. You know, I, I think that would that would be a positive message for the kids. You know, don't be a bully. You know, Richelieu is it? Uh, yeah, all right. The anti Richelieu thing. Um, yeah, some some bullies respect men with even more power, kind of thing. You know, but yeah. Yeah, and and you know Richelieu mocks the idea that the the musketeers are noble again, making us really hate him. And yeah, that's right. And that brings us to the execution that I will that that was definitely partially inspired by the the ninety one Robin Hood, the way that you know oh they they infiltrate or is it that or was it in the book and it was. And the Robin Hood movie was inspired by... Anyway, there's there's definitely some cross-pollination going on there, is all I'm saying. It is shot and cut very well. I really love that, you know, first you you have... Uh, let's see, is it an apple? Maybe it's some kind of fruit, you know. the A, a fruit is, is on the thing, and, the, you know, the axe cleaves it clean. And as it falls out of shot... Let's see, I think it's that... Is it that he walks up the, the ladder and then his head is in front of... It's, it's something like that. So we, you know... The movie does not depict someone having their head cut off. Because that's a bit intense for a PG rating. But the kids understand, oh, his... You know, there's danger there. You know, that because of that subtle little framing. Beautifully done. Um, and then there's that bit where they measure for the coffin... And they, they don't measure up to here, they measure to here. And then they continue working on it, you know. I think the movie had at least one too many of things where, like, suddenly Charlie Sheen... I, 
I'm just going to be calling him Charlie Sheen. Suddenly Charlie Sheen is, you know, he has disguised himself and he is hidden. You know, I think it was, uh, was it maybe fine? Like, yeah, why, how was he there at the end of the movie? How did he know to get on the boat? Like, you know, why, what, what made him so sure that they wouldn't catch up to him? I can, I can basically buy it here. Like, okay, they can't break him out of prison. That's, you know, that's just not feasible. But he can, you know, stand, he, he can dress up as the executioner and free him there. You know, which is, again, just, it's a tiny bit too convenient in my opinion, I think it would have been, but, but anyway, the, yeah, you know, it's, it's, a uh, it's very nicely done. Then they ride away from there in the Cardinal's own carriage and they go straight Robin Hood. Like the, the movie takes a break from being a three musketeer story and just becomes Robin Hood for, a, you know, redistribute the wealth, which is also a, a great, you know, great phrasing. But yeah, he you know he throws the all the gold on the on the ground and the the poor run up and and grab it and yeah, you know that that is great. I I wish the movie focused more on it, but if it's you know if that's all we're gonna get, that's not it's not nothing. And let's see. Um. Yeah, um, then we have... Okay, so yeah, these notes might be out of order chronologically. But, yeah, so... Um, I can't help but notice there's a lot of shots of cleavage in this movie, which, like... I mean, I guess it's in case parents do go to see it with their kids, or for possible teenagers or something but just yeah and yeah you know the the movie is basically saying casual sex is good for men bad for women the the men that engage in it are fully drawn characters the women who engage in it are either are shamed if they're major characters or you know barmaids that aren't like could you could you name a single barmaid in this movie could you point to one and say something about her other than who kisses her whereas again you know i get it it's in the book i didn't think it needed to be in the movie i think that it would have been i would have preferred for the women to get something more like yeah, you know, n none of the women get action scenes, which again, just, you know, I, off the top of my head, I could name three separate action scenes from the 2011 one, where Mila Jovovich is either the focus or one of the focuses, you know, and yeah, the 73 one... Not much, but there is a little bit of action for the women. The women are... Yeah. Now, let's see. And... Uh, what does that... Y yeah, you know, according to this movie, good women do their duty. You know, Anne never even... Like, she, she wants to, to love him also. She wishes she could love the, the king, but... You know, like, she never considers cheating or, or divorce or anything. And evil women are, you know, seductive and, and manipulative. Again, the only major character who's intentionally a seductive woman is De Winter. And she is aligned with the, the evil, you know, yeah. And the, yeah, so there's another scene with... Con Containing a carriage. Yeah, it's not this. Wait. Or is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, yeah, it's the same carriage, I think. But they're, you know. So they, they put some, some gunpowder inside it, light it, and, you know, send the carriage going towards the, was it like a military base, I guess? And, you know, because it hits the, the gunpowder, 
they have it's an american movie so there has to be a, in an american action movie so there has to be at least one car that explodes even if we have to contrive a setup like that yeah i liked it i'm not saying i didn't like it i just and yeah you know when they teach d'artagnan to kiss and i think does yeah i think i think uh Kiefer sutherland is the only one who doesn't kiss one of you know the other three musketeers do kiss at least one woman, and yeah, they're basically face. I mean, the only reason that they're not like literally like kissing the 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 hand or something is because a lot of people think that's an embarrassing way to practice kissing. But is it great to practice kissing if if the person you're kissing is someone you don't feel anything for other than desire? I, you know, I mean, for all that the women contribute to the scene, the guys might as well be talking about, like, their different sword hilts or something. Like, my sword hilt has a this thing, and that's why, you know... It's also kind of ridiculous how Oliver Platt is... Like, he has a gadget for every situation. It's like, okay, I get it. 90s action movie. It's gonna have gadgets. I don't think it was necessary for him to have so many of them. Like, so he has the thing with the three cleave, you know, so you can capture a, a sword and break it off. He's got the, the, what's it called? Yeah, they don't give him a musket, but they do give him, ah, crap, what are they called again? It's like a, um, yeah, the, the crossbow. He, he has this tiny little crossbow thing. And, you know, like a, like a handgun version of a crossbow not the the big kind that you know i could i could respect if he you know lunged that thing and you know was lugging that thing around the whole time but you know obviously not but th that wouldn't have made sense but yeah he's got like a utility belt practically of like a gadget for every scenario and that just felt kind of silly for yeah and let's see the um yeah, so, you know, also, for for women, it's it's a good thing if they fall in love. You know, that's, you know, Queen Anne and Constance talk about that a little. And they should resist bad people, but they don't get to fight. They don't get to control their lives. You know, they, let's see. Uh, yeah, they don't get to have any serious kind of power. If they have a job, it is se severely gendered. You know, the queen... I forget what the... Lady-in-waiting, I think it's called. You know, she's basically, like... She's taking care of the queen, is what Constance does. Which, again, like... Constance has a lot... Is, is extremely important in the 73 version. And actually gets to, to do stuff. You know, and here, like, honestly, I forgot Constance was in this. Like, I was watching the 73 and the 2011 one, and I was like... Is Constance in the 93 one? Because, like, I, again, you know, I remembered, I remembered all four Musketeers. I remembered the, I remembered Richelieu. I remembered Rochefort. You know, I remembered, yeah, I don't actually, yeah, I don't think I remember the, the, the King and the Queen. You know, when I, when I watched it when I was younger, because they, they don't get anything to do. And I, yeah, I get it, I get it. Part of the idea is that, you know, the two prominent, or the, I don't think I can really justify calling them prominent. Two of the women, the two women who aren't evil and have names, you know, the, the things they get to do are, you know, it's, it's supposed to be like, oh, it's good for young girls to, you know, as a role model. And it's, you know, oh, falling in love is really important to girls. As if guys don't, you know, it's it's such a it's such a ridiculously gendered because you could easily make it more of a thing, but you could you could make it gender. Let's see, okay, so D'Artagnan does talk to Kiefer Sutherland about being in love, and Sutherland talks about how, you know, he he regrets the way he treated the woman he loved. So there is some there, but because it's not the only thing they do, you know, you like. If you're someone who doesn't really care that much about love, you're probably lying to yourself, but whatever. The, the, 
you know, I'm just saying, for the girls, all they can take away is, oh, I'm supposed to do my duty, I'm, you know, it's good if I fall in love with someone, sometimes you fall in love with someone the moment you see them, kind of thing, you know, which is also, I, I'm not gonna get into a thing here about how, I, if, I would like to suggest that Americans come up with another word, see, in Danish, we have a word for actual love, the, the creepy uppy kind of love, and a different word for the experience, the, the emotional, hormonal experience of feeling like, okay, this is, you know, the, the yeah, being in love. Being in love in Danish is for its school. The creepy uppy kind of love is kærlighed. Those are very different. And I wish that was the same in American because it, the, the language really does do a lot to shape how we think. And a lot of people think that falling in love with someone means that you should be with them rather than just, okay, if both of you are in love with each other, this that that's a good start, but it's not the end goal. The end goal, you got to make sure you know each other. You got to make sure you respect each other before you, you know, form a, a long-term relationship. I'm not saying that casual sex, I don't think there's something wrong with casual sex. I just, I can't help but notice that in this movie, it's very, it's, it's just for men. You know, women aren't allowed to have more casual sex or be in love with someone that they aren't. You, you know, basically, like, if Constance has a conflict, it's that she's trying to figure out, should I be with the person that I think I'm in love with? Because we only met briefly. How can I know? And Queen Anne doesn't say, well, there is a difference between being in love and long-term love. She just says, yeah, it's true. Love at first sight does exist. And it does. It absolutely does. But it's not something you can build a relationship on. Now, let's... See. So, 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 yes, yes, for sure. If you fall in love with someone and the only thing either of you want is casual sex. If, if you just want to have sex once and then that's it. As long as both of you... as if, if that's what both of you want and if you live in a culture where that doesn't ruin your chances of, you know... I mean, I don't know if... Not everybody wants to get married today, but long-term happiness... Let's see. And, yeah, I mean, uh, I appreciate that the only man seen to sexual assault anyone is actually Richelieu. And he's a bit of a serial sexual assaulter. He's constantly trying to seduce, you know, De Winter, Anne, you know. So, yeah, evil people... Sexual assault and sexual assault is evil. I approve. Yeah, and and you know the the Richelieu is trying to make the the king not believe in the rumors, so he says, "Ah, oh, you know, I make pigs dance and horses fly," which is just a ridiculous thing to you know. No, no, no. The the pigs are the ones who fly. Although I think it is easier to teach a horse to dance than a pig. I don't think, I'm not sure you can actually teach a pig much of anything, which I respect. Like, they are basically like, no, it's, screw you, got my own life, I'm, you know, I'll, I'll do what I want to do, kind of thing, you know. Let's see, yeah, I, um, at this point I noted, I can't help but, like, sometimes the camera is actually more interested in a woman's cleavage than her face, even when the character is, like, has a, has a name and is important, like De Winter. And the only time she, kiss, you know, she almost kisses D'Artagnan, and it's just to stab him. And let's see. Then we have the um, ah, what's it called? Oh, she yeah, she does kiss Kiefer Sutherland right before, you know, jumping off to. Her death or the sequel, whichever. I guess since it doesn't have a sequel, presumably it, that killed her. But yeah. Um, what was the 
thing that I wanted to say about, let's see. Um, yeah, yeah, the, you know, so, yeah, she uses her, you know, she seduces people in order to get into a situation of power over them, which, again, you know, it wouldn't be that difficult for them to have. Yeah, actually, yeah, every woman in this, it's basically a man who chooses... Like, I'll, I'll grant that Constance is allowed to decide if, you know, D'Artagnan doesn't really force her into the two of them having a relationship. But other than that, it's basically the men who decide who the women are with. You know, with, with Anne, it was apparently her father and Richelieu who chose the husband. And, and yeah, I appreciate, you know, them saying that... You know, Anne, it, like, Anne doesn't, like, immediately, ah, what's the word? She respects when the king, you know, expresses his opinion uh, in, a, in a very clear way. I, I suppose harsh isn't quite right, but in a very clear way to Richelieu. You know, that she clearly respects. And other, you know, before that, she's like, I don't know if I actually love him, but, you know, kind of thing. So, so there's something, but yeah, I, I appreciate that the king is not made out to be horrible, which in the book, if I recall, he is pretty detestable. And, and you know, this movie isn't as confused about the king as the 2011 movie. And let's see. Yeah, so the, the musketeers have, you know, captured the, the ship. Yeah, I've... I, I buy it because it is like, you know, okay, they knew when the ship was going to leave. They knew what it would leave for. Okay, they could find the right ship. I can accept that. But I don't think it was necessary for there to be three times where Charlie Sheen surprises someone by, you know, having replaced someone else in that kind of, you know. So it happens with, um, see, actually, yeah. I completely forgot. When I said earlier, I didn't even remember about the ship. I only remembered the the little... Uh, is that a boat? The, the With Richelieu at the very end. And then the execution. I didn't even remember that he also took over the ship. It just runs together. And because it was the 90s, of course, we have one Asian person and they're a martial artist, which I'm sure the Asian immigrant children were just ecstatic about. I'm sure they were they were treated really well by the other kids whenever a, an Asian in a movie was a, a martial arts expert. I don't even know this guy's name. Uh, he doesn't have a line in English. You know, I, I don't know if what he says means something or if it's just like, noises to, to, like, intimidate the opponent. opponent, And we even have Oliver Platt, the white guy, making fun of him. So, yeah. Let's see. And... Yeah, so it is... I, I do appreciate that, you know, De Winter, she became a killer because she was falsely accused and then not believed by her own husband. She wasn't originally a killer it was actually a false accusation against her i forget if that's true in the book as well if or but that was probably the you know disney definitely did not want to say oh no you can redeem a killer uh, huh, no but but yeah so it is basically a theme in this movie that if you treat people badly they may actually do bad things you know, we also saw it with the the prisoner who was executed at the start of the movie who just fed his family. Let's see. Because, you know, to be sure, stealing is wrong, but he only did it to feed his family. And the fact that, you know, Kiefer Sutherland forgives De Winter is seen as a good thing, and he, he begs her for forgiveness because that leads her to confess, you know, to, to yeah, to, to give the last little bitch of, of bit of that almost sounded like I I did not mean to say the word that that might have sounded like it that was what it got her to give up the little bit of information that she still had that they were going to assassinate the king 
and the let's see yeah and you know the the yeah so so the the that once that is once the three of once the three musketeers know that they you know they they fire that that thing which was all very robin hood of that says one for all one for all and all for one you know they they shoot the paper with that onto trees a lot of places and that brings together the the musketeers who had begrudgingly disbanded but they kept their weapons and tunics and that does also say you know you don't have to be the main character to be a noble man no noble men gather together you know to to fight together for good and that's again that's a good thing there, there are a lot of american movies that kind of say if you're not the leader if you're a man and you're not the leader yeah, that's not good. That's you should you should be ashamed of yourself. Frankly, you should fight to be the leader. And it's like we can only have one leader of each movement at a time, or a small group of leaders. A lot of people are going to have to follow, and it's important to communicate to young people. It's not bad to follow as long as you're sure that what you're following is good. It's you know it's actually it's a big problem if you have a lot of young men who are certain no i'm the leader and and so they can't they they get they get nothing done or they get attracted to people who just you know just because this man says i'm a leader i'm strong i'm alpha that means a bunch of other people flock behind them that's a bad thing and so so yeah you know this movie has no buckingham no pearls so yeah, if if you if that bothers you and you want a more direct adaptation, the seventy three one, I would recommend for that. And yeah, so at first the king does not believe Anne, but you know basically, over time she you know eventually he does accept her you know and uh, let's see so so yeah you know it's good for men to believe women at least the ones close to them. You know, you, you shouldn't, if, if you run into a De Winter, you shouldn't trust her much at all, is still the message here. Um, let's see. And so, yeah, the the many musketeers join, three musketeers versus the, the you know, Richelieu's guards, and that was quite cool to, to see. And, yeah, we find out Rochefort killed D'Artagnan's father, completing the, the, um... Ah, is that a spoiler? That's not a spoiler. You know, they basically Darth Vadered him. Like, I don't... If I recall, I think Rochefort in the book does kill D'Artagnan's father, but it ha you know, we, we know that from the start of the story. It's not just dumped it. Like, I guess Rochefort thinks that it'll weaken his resolve when obviously we in the audience know it'll strengthen it. Like... I killed your father. He's he's not gonna like throw down the sword and I have to, Well, okay then. And I I appreciate that Richelieu is a man who uses religion to his own ends and considers himself above the laws of men. Let's see. And you know the cross saves Charlie Sheen, which there's a there's a sentence. And yeah, uh, you know the guy in the in the torture area is you know conventionally unattractive and thus evil, which is another bad message, frustrating. But I do appreciate you know he gets branded with his own brand and ends up you know dying at the you know because of his own torture device. So that's poetic justice. I do appreciate that. And let's see. Yes, you know Constance does get to help. She gets D'Artagnan his sword back, and that's apparently all that they thought women were capable of. Let's see, and you know, De Winter does get a lot more redemption in this movie than she does in the book and seventy three. And 
you know, she she is the only character who starts out evil early in the movie and turns good. So I do appreciate that, you know, that that the only character to to change allegiance from evil to good is a woman. You know, so so there is that message of you know give women a chance if you think that they've done something wrong, give them a, a yeah. Let's see and yeah. So Richelieu ends on the on the boat that we fall, saw him at the start. Even the king, like not an action scene, but an action beat. You know, he punches the Richelieu. No woman gets to, even though I would say, by and large, Anne is much more badass. And that's not only because she's played by Fiona, but, yeah, it's, yeah, I, you know, this was, the, there were still a lot of movies in the 90s that didn't, maybe especially children's ones. Disney was kind of slow. Thankfully, they have now done it, you know, um, I want to, Brave, was that a Disney one? I, f I feel like it was, and certainly Frozen has much more active female, you know, they're even protagonists. You know, the, the Disney animated protagonists that were female used to just have to wait around for a man, which, yeah. Um, let's see, what was the other thing? There was one more thing that I wanted to say. Um, the, the action and Fiona and, right, yeah, the, the... Um, wait, was the, yeah, I already mentioned that there's more, that the women get more to do in 73 and 2011, Robin Hood, that was the one, yeah, you know, th that one, I, I, I'm not, not as much as, I'd, I'd still like even more, but there is at least some, you know, and the, let's, so yeah, there's the, and, and the, yeah, the women are very important in, in that movie and not, you know, second-class citizens kind of thing. And I think, right, I have a little bit, I think I'll just, um, right, yeah, so the, according to the, the MDB, the, the location thing, the underground lake and dungeons were an actual location in, in Austria. That's really, really cool. I would have thought that that was, like, yeah, it's really, really cool. And let's see, um, oh, that's right, yeah, the execution scaffold thing, that isn't, that isn't in the Three Musketeers book, but it is, there is something similar in Alexandre Dumas book featuring the musketeers so that's yeah yeah that is all that i had so hit me up in the comments let me know what is your favorite three musketeers story or alexandre dumas adaptation in general if they make another one really soon and it's like a movie what do you hope to see in it if you like this movie, please thumbs up, subscribe, hit that little bell like it is working for Richelieu. There should be a link to my main channel page, one, two more links to stuff like relevant playlists, a suggested video for you to watch on the screen right about now. I put out one vlog per week reviewing and sharing spoiler thoughts on a movie. And when the, you know, when, when next we get some Disney Plus MCU content or live action Star Wars, I will also cover that and recently the review and thoughts videos tend to come out very similar to this one in other words if you want videos like this you're in luck you can check out my back catalogs what's catch my next week i hope you enjoyed watching as i enjoyed watching and recording i'll catch you next time one for all and boy am i glad i'm not going to hear that phrase anymore in the near future because boy is there a lot of that in this movie